All right, trustees, if you would, uh, it is uh, the appointed time of 5.30, and I'd like to uh, acknowledge that we're starting the regular meeting for Tuesday, May the 19th, 2020, for the Lynn College Board of Trustees. If you would bear with me one more time, I'm gonna read some information that uh, I need to, to, to uh, put in the record. Uh, public access to this meeting will occur in rooms two and three of the Blinn College District Student Center located at 651 Blinn Boulevard, Brenham, Texas. Any member of the public who wishes to attend the meeting or make public comment at the meeting will need to do so in rooms two or three of the student center. As required by state law, this meeting is open to the public, but by telephone communications. The college is complying with the suspended proceedings of the Open Meetings Act in accordance with sections 418.016 of the Texas Government Code. Members of the public are entitled to participate and address the college through remote connections. A live stream of this meeting will be available on youtube.com slash blend1883. Uh, let me make a note that the subjects discussed are considered uh, are upon which any formal action may be taken or as follows, and items do not need to be considered in, in the same order as shown on the, on the agenda. I'd now like to call a meeting to order and uh, tell you that the uh, Texas Government Code permits the Board of Trustees to meet in closed executive session for the following reasons, to consult with the college district's attorneys on matters deemed privileged by the Texas Disciplinary Rules of Professional Contact, Conduct, or Government Code 551.071, to deliberate regarding real property under .072, a prospective gift under .073, certain personnel matters under .074, security devices on, or security audits under .076, and economic development negotiations under .087. If the, board meet, if the board meets in closed session, we will announce a particular section under which we will be doing so prior to initiating the closed portion of the meeting. We will, in fact, be having an executive session and there'll be no action taken from that meeting. I'd now like to call on uh, Reverend Randy Wells. Randy, if you would give us the invocation, please. Let us pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ, we bow in your presence and we pray that you will continue to bless our city, our county, our country during this COVID-19 crisis. We thank you for our creative leadership through our chancellor and our faculty and staff, and we thank you for the tremendous students that continue to pursue a higher education. We pray that you will give us your wisdom now as we deliberate the issues pertaining to this college. We thank you for our healthcare workers, those on the front lines, essential workers, continue to bless them and keep them. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. 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 If, if, trustees, if you'll all stand, we'd like to have Teddy lead us in the pledge to the American and the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Reverend Wells, and thank you, Mrs. Bain. Uh, under public comment, we have no one sign up for any comment. So that takes us down to the reports. Trustees, I'm gonna say that uh, I'm gonna call on Dr. Hensley, but before I do so, I wanted to tell you that uh, the, I think we're gonna hear from Dr. Hensley and we're gonna hear from uh, several of the uh, vice chancellors and of the tremendous work that they've been doing over the last couple of months. It's, going to culminate in what we're going to be trying to do going forward under these crazy times that we're living in right now. And, and so I think it, uh, it's going to be most interesting and, and uh, helpful for us to understand what, what the issues are and, and how they're going to try to resolve them. So, uh, Dr. Hensley, I'm going to let you go ahead and take the ball here and, and run with it. Thank you. Well, I'll go ahead and start this evening with our regular chancellor's report. So thank you, Chair Mosier, and all of the trustees. It's so good to literally see you again in so long. 
Um, I'd like to start off by directing your attention to the screen behind you or to the television screen in front of you, whichever is most convenient, and tell you about eSports. So that is our new logo for eSports. Well, Trust City, since you approved the launch of the, God bless you, since you approved the launch of the new eSports team on the Brenham and the Bryan campuses, we have launched a campaign to promote community awareness and to recruit students for the fall 2020 semester. Um, as part of this campaign, we have launched a new web page at www.blend.edu slash esports. This page includes a frequently asked questions page and a recruiting form where prospective students can submit their contact and gaming information. A press release promoting the college's recruiting activities was released in April and Blend has launched a digital advertising campaign to support the program. As of this morning, trustees, 65 students have completed the recruiting form and are in touch with Max Hibbs, our Dean of Engineering, Computer Technology and Innovation. So we are literally off and running. Now let's switch over to something that I so enjoyed and I hope you appreciate it as well. Um, as you know, sadly, the cancellation of our campus events due to COVID-19 meant that our Blinn College Band was unable to perform the concerts that usually mark the typical end to our spring semester each year. Well, to overcome this hurdle, our band director, Dr. Sarah Burke, developed a digital band project shortly after our face-to-face -face classes were discontinued. And this performance of Frank Ticelli's Shenandoah is posted on Blinn's <coughs> music department webpage and on our social media web pages and so far we have received more than 1,100 views since it was posted. Now this video is six minutes long and I'm not going to play off all of it but just to give you a moment I'd like to give you maybe about 45 seconds to a minute so that you can see this lovely video. Well, you can see the sound wasn't as good there, but it, it, um, the students come in and start playing together, and it builds into a wonderful, very emotional, and very heart-moving um, crescendo, and it's really, really special. So I encourage you to go to Blend's media page and see if you can watch it, and I'm sorry the sound wasn't as wonderful as the effort that was put in to create this video. They did a, just a fantastic job. Well, if I might, I'd like to switch over now to our new science, technology, engineering, and innovation building and give you an update on this one. Um, let's see. Um, at this time, the, on the Brenham camp campus, the construction has begun on this facility. I don't know if you've had a chance to drive by recently, but there's a very recent picture from a drone so that you can see that we have cleared the land there. So the building footprint currently is being excavated and we continue to work with the architect to design, excuse me, to finalize the design of various soft cost budget items including facility technology and furniture fixtures and equipment. And this project as you know is scheduled for completion in August of 2021. 
And then in regards to our P3 student housing project trustees, we are currently engaged. We have been very engaged in, every day in the planning and design meetings with our stakeholders on this one. I'd like to let you know that the science student housing market study is near completion. In fact, I believe that occurred just today. And this project is going, the study rather, is going to be used to help them seek bond funds for this project. Now, it's very clear that the bond market has its uncertainties to it. And so the project will now be comprised of two student housing facilities. We shared this with you in recent discussions. Uh, one building will hold 320 students, and the other building will hold 184 beds, as, um, respectively. Now, the 100 an 84 bed facility will be constructed first and it will be completed by August of 2021 and the 320 bed facility is scheduled for occupancy the following January so that would be January of 2022 and now we'll move to the Castone project at the Bryan campus I'll be so glad, won't you, once we finish this one, because you've heard me talk about this every month now for more than a year. So uh, the sealants, the plaster headers, and the stonework above the windows are now complete on all of the buildings. The facade on building F is scheduled for completion the first week in June, so we're almost there. Um, and then you know recently you did some action regarding the T building and the roof replacement. So this is at the Bryan campus. Uh, work has uh, begun and it began on April the 30th and it is moving along ahead of schedule. And this project is uh, planned for completion this August. And then let's talk about our wonderful Ag and Workforce Education Complex. So at the Rellis campus, again with from uh, drone footage, footage that you're able to see here, uh, this is the uh, Agriculture and Workforce Education Complex. Now it is substantially complete and the building uh, will be available for move in in about a month from today, around June the 15th. Um, all existing equipment has been inventoried and the schedule for move-in will be coordinated with the access to the building and class schedules. Uh, we begin, Blend begins, uh, planning to offer classes this fall semester and in this building. And uh, in working with the A&M system, we had hoped to have a grand opening in July, but we have tentatively pushed the back that and we are looking at determining a date in September. We'll keep you posted on that and hope that you will be able to attend as well. And then regarding RELIS Phase 2, uh, our design team continues to meet with the steering committee and our user groups to define the programming for this project. A final presentation of the programming and a preliminary design will be presented to you at the board uh, meeting in July, excuse me, in June at our regular board meeting. And we may be putting out some information I anticipate on OneNote for you to get a little advanced information as we begin to see that. Um, trustees, later on in this evening, uh, once we have the reports, and it will be right after Mr. Cervantes does the financial report, we have numerous blend personnel who are going to provide you a very comprehensive report and plan for Blinn's response to the COVID-19 for this summer and for next fall. So you won't see everybody in the room, but many of them are on telephone right now, and many of them are at off-site locations uh, where they are going to video conference in. So they are completely aware of the conversation that's occurring. Some of them are on this floor right now, and they will step in as we begin to discuss uh, the COVID-19. I encourage you to ask your questions and to make sure you're comfortable with everything we're sharing with you. So as trustees, you'll be prepared to answer any community questions. Um, we do have a very <coughs> detailed draft that I've been working on for a couple of weeks that uh, subsequent to, to this evening's conversation, I will be sending out to all faculty and staff this memo is directed to Blinn's employees. Naturally, they have many questions, as do you. So we <coughs> try to literally lay out, lay out for them everything that potentially is going to occur at Blinn, starting from this evening all the way through the fall semester. And so you're going to hear each of the vice chancellors and others present their sections that they're most um, aware of 
and uh, they're kind of the leader of. And so do ask any questions that you have. Based on tonight's conversation then, I will uh, modify the memo and if we're good to go, we'll send it out later tonight or if not, we'll send it out tomorrow, but it definitely will be going out in the next day or two, hopefully maybe this evening. So with this one, you're essentially having, having an opportunity to hear one more time what our plans will be for the COVID-19 response and for blend operations for summer and for fall. Okay. All right, we look forward to that part of the conversation. Trustees, I anticipate that that one agenda item alone will probably take us about 45 minutes we do have uh, numerous speakers who will be speaking to it, and we'll remind you again before they speak, but Leighton Schubert will be speaking, our Executive Vice Chancellor. We'll be having uh, Mr. Cervantes speak, Vice Chancellor, Business and Finance. We'll have um, Dr. Busicki speaking <coughs> from the academic side. We'll have Karen Buck speaking from Student Services and Administration side. We'll have Chief Chancellor speaking from Law Enforcement side and Emergency Management perspective. We have Rich Bray speaking from Marketing and Public Information. And have I left anybody out, Leighton? Uh, Marie Kirby, Assistant Marie Vice Kirby Chancellor. Marie Kirby is also, take. she's over at the Bryan campus in, on, in the conference room over there. And she will be speaking from the perspective of uh, <coughs> faculty and staff and questions regarding hiring and layoffs and so forth. So our desire tonight is just give you a complete comprehensive view of everything. That, so now is your time to ask in a few minutes. And then at the end of the presentation um, following, we, uh, I didn't mention we have Dr. Alford also coming tonight and Jason Jennings from Baylor Scott and White. They will be here and they will come into the room. They will be physically present with us. Now they, um, they all know that we're wearing masks and they were, are wearing masks in their work as well. And um, they are going to remove their masks when they speak. Uh, so we're trying to have them also join us so that they can talk about Blend's response in terms of what's appropriate for public health perspective as well as Blend's impact into the community. <coughs> regarding the health perspective. And then after all of that, then Leighton will give you an update on CARES and a, and a few other things. So that one's going to be a, a bit lengthy. With that, Mr. Mosier, I return the mic back to you. Can I ask you a question uh, uh, before they get started? Uh, back to the science building. Are, are there, uh, tell me again, or tell us, uh, the, is there gonna be any parking added over there on the football field side of the of Fifth Street? So I'll be happy to speak to that, and Leighton and um, Richard, please come in too. On the fit football field per se, no, there is no added parking. Um, but if you were just this side of the P3 location, diagonally across the street from the new science building, we have put a additional parking in there. And also we have added uh, additional parking on the south end of the building. Uh, Richard, do you want to expand on that a little bit more? Um, is that clear? I think, yeah, I think what you said <laughs> was exactly what, what uh, is a circumstance that we're going to have. So, so if you would have. think between Spencer Stadium and the P3 structure itself, there's going to be a long parking lot, but that isn't impacting what uh, is new. It's nothing new. It's what we've already had there. It's just been gravelly and not, not wonderful dirt. All right. Uh, but we will have additional parking that will be paved on the south end of the building. We did that in, and that's included in the cost that the trustees have already approved. All right. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Go ahead. Mr. Chairman? Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. <laughs> I, I just want to make one comment. Uh, I think the uh, congratulatory YouTube that, that you and, and uh, some of the other administrators did was really good. You didn't mention that in your report. No, I didn't. Okay. Thank you. We did uh, because of lack of graduation, and we just wanted to so do something special for our students. So we did a, a congratulatory uh, video that went out to all students, and it's on our media. And I spoke on it, and all, the, all of the campus executive deans spoke on it, and most of the vice chancellors, I think all of them spoke on it. It was really fun. Good. Great. Again, thank you so very much, Mr. Mosier. I'll return the podium back to you. <coughs> You're the man. He's the man. Okay, you, you're up. Thanks, thank you, sir. Uh, doc, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Dr. Hensley, members of the board. The financial report that we are <coughs> going to be looking at today 
is uh, through the month of April, which is the eighth month. We're two, through two thirds of the way through the, the fiscal year. The total revenue uh, for this fiscal year is 90, almost $92 million. The expense is $75 million, which leaves us a, a net of $17 million. Uh, it's a little bit, uh, and you'll hear me say this uh, sporadically throughout the presentation, we took $3.3 million of refunds, total refunds, uh, this year that we didn't have last year. And it obviously has uh, paid it, had an imp in impact on, the, <coughs> on, these, on these reports. When we compare the operating changes in, in net position and look at the revenues at the top, <coughs> as a result of that 3.3, we are $1, one million down. On the other hand, when we look at the expenditures, we're up by uh, $3.3 million, which is 4.6%. Our net increase in fund balance compared to last year is $4.3 million less than what we had last year. When we factor out that $3.3 million that we issued in refunds, it would still be down a million dollars, but not, not near as much as what we have here. Auxiliary sales and services obviously is the biggest one that has been impacted. Uh, we had 13.6 last year and 10.47 uh, this year. It's had an impact on, on the rest of these items too. The percentage has gone up just a little bit as a result of a, a, a smaller number and less in auxiliaries. Our actual versus budget. We budgeted $71 million in tuition and fees revenue. We are at $57.5 million, which puts us at 80.8, .8, which is less than what we had had uh, the year before. Our percentage was uh, a little bit higher. We had 85.8% .8 at this point last year. Uh, but on the other hand, our current year budgeted tuition and fees is $6 million higher than what we had had the, the previous year. We should quit doing that. Uh, tuition and revenue is up 100, I'm sorry, tuition revenue compared to 2019 is $180,000 to the plus. Uh, the tuition out of district is up $1 million, continues to take the lion's share. In district is also up $54,000 and out of state is down 124000 Our total fees are up 888000 Our general fee increased by one point. Two million dollars, and our lab course fees also increased 131. Workforce has declined. Uh, we think it may be attributed to class offerings for some of the, the non-credit. Actual versus budget, housing and food service. We were at. Uh, we budgeted 11 million dollars for both of those auxiliary services. The actual revenue comes in at $70.3 million, which puts us at 65%. And the big, big number there is a $3.3 million, $3 million uh, refund that we, uh, that we uh, submitted for refunds for our students. All, sorry, all the auxiliaries have uh, a decline in, in revenue, uh, but mostly you have food service, you have parking, and you have housing, and that's the, the most significant part of it. Total expenses uh, are uh, up 3.3 million dollars is the the total variance from 75 to from or so, sorry from 72 million dollars to 75. The majority of it, as we've said before, is in salaries and benefits. That's the bulk <coughs> of our of our cost. So 3.7, and you can attribute that to the 5 percent increase that we we gave to our our staff uh, employees this this year. Look at the percentage on the rise. Salaries and uh, wages continue to have the lion's share of our expenses, uh, the, as they always have. Our uh, debt service now is coming in line, as we actually made a payment in April to bring that uh, closer to what we had had the, uh, the year before. Expenses by category are uh, up $3.3 million to 4.6%. Uh, Percentage-wise, they're they're pretty close, pretty close to the same. 
Our operating expense comparison by function is up $3.6 million, <coughs> which is 5.7%. Uh, Again, the bulk of that uh, would be personnel costs, but you have a splattering of other things, increases in costs and services, and uh, software uh, continues to be a fairly large increase for us. I know you have some uh, uh, interest in the, 2000, the, the, the bottomless pit, the 2016 remaining bond projects. What I wanted to ch share with you, Mr. Chairman, is this, this number of 2.5 was actually uh, significantly more at the end of March. Uh, we had three over three point, we had three point nine million dollars. So we're chipping away at it. And uh, when you look at the science and technology and the Brian Cast Stone that are going to come to completion here in terms of that dollar amount, that's going to be almost a couple million dollars. So before I would imagine within the next couple months. Uh, we're going to be down to a, a really smaller number. And just again to give you some perspective, Mr. Chairman, in September when we began the year, we had ten and a half million dollars that we had in this. Uh, so we're we're chipping away, as it, as I, as I've said. Student cash and refunds in April. The total amount that we received much smaller than the normal because we issued those those refunds. $603,000 student financial aid that we drew down from the Department of Education is 392000 We issued the normal refunds, those that are on the left, the 577000 uh, We had student payments that were coming in at 3.7. And there's your COVID student refunds at uh, 2.8. You've heard me say uh, throughout the presentation that the total refund amount for those auxiliaries was $3.3 million, but those were offset by funds, uh, receivables that they owed us. And so it ended up coming down closer to $2.8 million. Our other cash receipts in, in April uh, totaled it up a little bit, $4.2 million. Interest, we had a small amount, $38,000. Our state appropriation uh, consistently, $2.3 million. We did receive some grants and contracts, uh, miscellaneous. That's actually mostly taxes, the 157000 We did draw down some of our bonds. Uh, that's for some of the capital projects that we had. Uh, gives us a total of 4.2. Our uses of cash in, in April, payroll, of course, continues to uh, have the lion's share, 57 and there's some of our capital projects on the left, $1.7 million. Not as much in accounts payable uh, this month, 1.6. We did make that bond payment uh, at the beginning of April, as I as I indicated, and then a small amount to uh, to Servitas. So, uh, in synopsis, we had 603,000 in cash that we received from students, and then from other sources, four million dollars. However, we ended up using 10.6 million dollars. Uh, brought us down to a net decrease in cash in April. We had to draw some money from the Texas investment pools uh, to do that, and our local operating bank had, had a portion of it, $2 million, too. I uh, mentioned to you in the budget report that we had uh, <coughs> $95.4 million. That's at the end of April. We expect that number is going to go up. That can, that's uh, uh, just to show you where that's coming from. We have that five months reserve that's $42.5 million. I mentioned we were a little bit over $15 million in our capital projects and deferred maintenance reserves, so we made a little bit of money on that investment. And then leaves our unrestricted cash balance at $37.5 million. I'll stand for any questions, Mr. Chairman? Any questions? Hearing none, Mr. Savanis, we appreciate it. Thank you very much. <clears throat> we'll move on now to uh, Mr. Schubert. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Dr. Hensley, fellow trustees. Uh, as you heard from Dr. Hensley, we have a, a full slate of people that are going to come through and, and discuss uh, the college's wide-ranging response to our COVID-19 situation. You're going to hear from the internal blend personnel that the chancellor <coughs> mentioned, also uh, Jason Jennings and Dr. Alford from Baylor, Scott & White are going to be here. Uh, and then at the end, we'll have time for questions uh, from, from the entire group, depending on what you have. Uh, we've uh, got to jump right into it. Uh, the first up, we have Vice Chancellor Marcelo Bosicki to discuss the academic side of this.
Good afternoon, Dr. Hensley, Chair Moser, members of the board. Thank you for the, the invitation to share with you uh, information, <coughs> summary information of the actions that were taken during the spring semester to address the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. I also would like to, to share with you some of the plans that we have in place for the fall, for the, sp for the summer classes, summer one uh, and summer two, as well as the fall semester. As you know, <clears throat> within the span of one week, uh, the, uh, the college had to, in, in March, had to transfer 2008 eight sections from a face-to-face -face and hybrid format into a fully online. That was a daunting task for both students and, and faculty. We had to address those issues with training and also making small tweaks within our guidelines for grading to support students' needs, right? So, um, what we decided to do is that uh, our, our definition of, of incomplete, for example, was somewhat uh, slight change. Uh, students were able to drop a course without being punished with the six state drop. And also they were offered the opportunity to do a pass or no pass, in other words, pass fail grades. Uh, we had approximately 115 by the, date, the, the deadline that we uh, established for all these functions, which had different deadlines. We had about 115 students that chose to go with an incomplete. Uh, about 1,520 students decided to drop their courses. Considering the situation, it, 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 is, it is higher than last year, but considering the situation, it was just one-third of what the number that we had last, the previous <clears throat> year. And 1,186 students decided to opt to a pass-fail grade. These numbers are still fluctuating because students are still making adjustments here and there, but in general, those are the, that is what uh, uh, the numbers that we had the last, last time. Um, also, training and preparation for the, f the summer continues, right? So do, throughout the summer classes, we already started with the mini master. The mini master is fully online. Summer one will be fully online. And there's a remote possibility that summer two might, might uh, go, uh, or part of summer two might go live. Uh, we are not planning at this time for that. But should the scenario change, we have classes ready to go live for summer two. Uh, and all this the training, obviously, that we had to establish for the spring semester continues throughout the summer and as it comes for the fall. By the instructional designers, instructional designers prepared faculty for within one week, prepare a very uh, basic course to teach online to help those faculty members transition from face-to-face -to, -face, uh, to fully online. The Learning Center worked very hard preparing student support, and is working still very hard, preparing student support all virtual, and the library did the same. I, I, Mr. Chair, if I, if I may, I would like to open a parenthesis to thank our, our faculty and staff throughout this process. They, we have a phenomenal, phenomenal group of faculty. Their world was changed upside down within one week and they pulled it off. I, I am extremely proud. I could not be happier from, uh, than, than I am now with that. So training for, training for, the, <clears throat> for faculty. As I mentioned to you, we created within one week a very basic uh, course for, uh, for eCampus, which is the platform that we use to, to teach online. Approximately 65 faculty members participated of that, that, that week, but they continue visiting portions of that course. But that is not enough for what's coming. So we will continue training and train for, for uh, eCampus all faculty members that are teaching currently at Plain College. 
Uh, we had a deadline of May, May 15 for everybody to, uh, to complete their courses. Uh, I'm sure that everybody, not everybody completed it. Uh, on, the eight, on the 11th, we had 113 uh, uh, faculty members that still needed to go through that training, but I'm, I'm absolutely convinced that we will hit our target by the beginning of the fall semester. Every faculty at Bend College will be trained to go on an e-campus course. <clears throat> also, <clears throat> during the summer, we prepared uh, faculty briefly to make sure that our classes, our online classes, look similarly throughout the platforms. Regardless of which class students is taking, we want them to know where to go and not start looking for, looking for where information is. So faculty is being trained at this time on that, and uh, the instructional designs continue to, to offer support for faculty. For students, we, we, we gave them a phenomenal, offered them a phenomenal opportunity, which is to do a tutoring online. We were very concerned that we had to close the, the, the tutoring center, the learning center, and did not have a support. The college approved the purchase of a very good software that's called Upswing that offers tutoring for students online. We had 16, uh, tutors already that were part of our learning center. They were trained on this software. We asked faculty to volunteer for tutoring. We had nine faculty members that, that offered to volunteer to tutor. Uh, we also had three librarians <coughs> that decided, excuse me, that decided to move their, uh, their tutoring for the library, how to do research in a library through this platform, this software. <coughs> Additionally, we also had a tutoring center for speech that was called the Speech Center. That also, those faculty members were also trained. So even the speech uh, students will have virtual tutoring. For the next year, we are also planning for the writing center to go virtual on that system. We are very, uh, it, it, this, this system, Upswing, has a very interesting virtual assistant that's called Anna. Uh, Anna is a very good friend of the students. She reminds them of their appointments for, for, uh, for tutoring. Uh, they, uh, she reminds them about their upcoming due dates for registration, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a very convenient uh, uh, s communication system that adds up to what we already doing in student services. And Chancellor Buck, will, Vice Chancellor Buck will talk to you about that later. This is how students find a tutoring online. This is a, uh, a landing page for their, for their web class, well, a website. This is the class. So they see right there the icon uh, online tutoring. They click there. It takes them to live tutors if they have anybody available or to schedule an appointment. The library, as I said, and the library is a good thing because they're already very well equipped for virtual support. <coughs> they had already a, a library chat, electronic database. They had 300 e-books, uh, online tutorials, embedded librarians, embed librarians embedded in classes, online classes, so that if students need support, they just click there and the librarians available to them. But they added, as I mentioned to you, this new feature of online tutoring sessions. We believe that <coughs> uh, particularly in the next two semesters, we are in the crossroads. We really need to, uh, to work and convince the students to uh, let go of the fear of taking an online class. So we prepared a sample course for, uh, for students to browse so that they better understand how an online class works. So if you see here, if it's student clicks in one of these, they will watch a video with an interaction with an instructor, an interactive lesson online. They could check out how a biology class works in an in online uh, environment. They can check how, how a walking class, a, a, a kinesiology class works online. So it's a very handy, uh, uh, op uh, feature for us to 
be able to advertise the quality of our courses. We must offer very good uh, online classes because that is the basic support of what's coming up in terms of offering classes for us. That's the safest format. Let me share with you the plans for the fall semester. As I mentioned to you, all uh, faculty will be trained in full e-campus training, which is a, it's a little longer course that they had uh, already taken. And all classes at Blinn, regardless of that modality, will have an e-campus presence. In other words, all the content of that class will be already online as the semester starts. Should we have a problem that all classes need like <coughs> during the spring to move into an online environment that can be done in a moment's notice? So I'm very, very happy that, uh, that we are able to accomplish that. The overall approach of how we will deal with the, the, the fall, essentially I, 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 I thought in, in, in three safety layers. One, by diminishing the length of this, each one of the semesters. So we will work with how long a semester lasts. A second layer will be how many people each one of the modalities bring on campus. Example, a face-to-face -face requires greater presence on campus from the part of the student. A blended class requires a lesser presence on campus and a fully online class does not, does not require any campus presence. Guess what? <clears throat> this, this fall, we decided that it's very important for us to focus and concentrate on blended and fully online classes. But <coughs> students like very much the face-to-face, -face, the entire face-to-face -face 16 semester courses. And there are some courses, say for example an architecture course or a music course or um, an art course uh, or an engineering course or a, a science lab. Those are courses that require a long practice, skill practice. Therefore, those are the ideal courses to remain in a 16-week format and in a face-to-face -face format. <coughs> However, the other courses, lecture-based courses, the idea is to transfer most of those courses, if not all of them, into a blended and online version as well as, and this is the important, in much smaller, let's use the word, chunks of semesters. Uh, in other words, much smaller terms. And we decided to go with terms that are multiples of four because we can divide up the 16-week full term into either eight first week and eight second week or a 12-week uh, semester plus a four-week semester, or a eight, four, and four, et cetera, et cetera. So that is the idea so that we are able to utilize the classrooms efficiently. Another advantage of this, this system is that the greatest difficulty that our students had during the transition uh, was the incredible amount of work that an online class requires of a student, uh, an incredible amount of self-discipline. That is for one class. When they have five classes concurrently, then it is very difficult. <clears throat> Many students, unfortunately, just gave up because they couldn't see the light at the end of the tunnel. So what we are going to do is to offer them the opportunity to take two classes in the first semester and eight, first eight semesters, and then two classes on the second eight term. That way, if something happens, everything is already, we already in, ended one semester, or we would have a lesser of a problem if we were to change that semester to an online environment. So this is um, essentially what I already uh, explained to you. 
Uh, we have a face-to-face -face that was going to be about 25% of our <coughs> classes. The remaining uh, uh, modalities will be hybrid and fully online. And then we will have those, those semester terms that are uh, much shorter. Hopefully it, hopefully it will help students stay on track and not drop before the end of the semester. I would like to give you, and then you are going to ask, okay, so, but you have not, we have not thought about the on-campus presence density in the classroom. Yes, we have. What we are going to have to do is to reduce the, the caps for certain classes. For example, the number that we are working today is that we should not have more than 10 students in a classroom. If that class meets twice a week, it's very conceivable that we can, we can have half of the class one day and half of the class the other day. Half of the class on a Monday, half of the class on a, on a Wednesday. But what about the, the other contact hours? And this is uh, another piece of this, this, uh, this plan, is that we really need a very robust uh, uh, virtual support system from the <coughs> classroom cameras that will broadcast essentially that class for students that are accessing the course remotely. So the plan is on Monday, say for this, for this hypothetical group, uh, on Monday we have 10 students on campus, okay, but these 10 students will be remote on Wednesday. And these, the group B of 10 students will be remote on Monday and on campus on Wednesday. That way we can control the density in class to up to 10 students. Uh, if we have a class Monday, Wednesday, Friday, like uh, Vice Chancellor Cervantes ma mentioned, we could have a 30 uh, class cap. One third of the class meets on Monday, one third meets face to face on, on Wednesday, and one third meets face to face on Friday. We believe that it's extremely important for the success of the course and for student success that those students meet with the faculty at least once every, uh, every semester, uh, every, every week. So this is what I, I, I think I covered everything. Uh, classroom utilization, I already mentioned to you <coughs> that we will try to maximize that by utilizing multiples of four semesters, uh, four weeks, and a, a very robust technology support in the classroom, which I am already working with, uh, with Michael Welch in academic technology. So that is the plan that we have to, to suggest to you. And uh, Vice Chancellor Buck will continue with this, uh, this presentation from the perspective of student services. Thank you very much, and I will be here for questions if you would like to ask any. Do, you, do we need to ask questions at the end, or would that be the best way? Or yes, sir. Thank okay, you. okay. Because your yes, sir, that would be the best if you could hold your questions to the end. Thank you, Mr. Moser, Dr. Hensley, board members. Um, as Dr. Basiki said, there were a lot of changes that had to happen on the academic side, but there were a lot of changes that happened on the student services and the recruitment side as well. I'm going to review some of those with you uh, tonight. One of the items that we continued to work on, and I had presented this at an earlier board meeting, was the funnel students. So the funnel students were those students that were denied admission to A&M. And we got a list of about 4,500 students back in January. And I talked to you about the, the format that we would use to communicate with those students. We were expecting another similar amount in March. Uh, that March date hit right in the middle of uh, the pandemic. And so we're not sure if that was the reason or if maybe A&M decided to hold back a little because of what we might call the melt, uh, maybe that some students may not accept um, the admittance. So in March, we only received 1,400 names from A&M, but we continued to pursue those names and to talk with those students. A few of the students did tell us as they would call in um, that they had received maybe an offer from A&M for teams, and then a week or so later, they had received an actual full admittance offer. So we had a few of those to work through. Uh, but again, we kept working that group very hard uh, by phone, by email, and through a variety of methods like text messaging. 
One of the other things that we had to move to be online was preview day. So preview day is an event that Blinn has had uh, for many years on both the Brenham campus and the Bryan <coughs> campus. And this is where students would come and they would learn about admissions, financial aid, advising. Uh, they could tour the dorms. Uh, they would bring their parents with them. And at this point in time last year, we had had about four of these events and about 400 students had attended. Because we had to move this online, we've had about 100 students participate. But again, we've been working with these students. What they do is they fill out this form. They get a video that they watch that has all the same information about advising, financial aid, admissions. And then within 24 hours, one of our recruiter calls them to say, you know, how did you enjoy the video? Do you have any more questions for us? And we think that's going to work out well in the remote environment that we're existing in. We also had something, uh, have done something called virtual visits. So in the virtual visit, the student can pick if they want to communicate with us in English or Spanish. And what virtual visits are is instead of coming to our campus, we used to be able to have tours, but we weren't able to do that on Brenham or Bryan or any of our campuses. So the student signs up for a virtual visit. They and their parents can sign up. And when they have that, one of our recruiters uh, gets online, meets with them, and they also step through with them the actual virtual tour of our campuses. About a year ago, you might remember that we shared with you those virtual tours where the student can see the Brenham campus and see the Bryan campus. So a recruiter <coughs> meets with these individuals, looks at the virtual tour of the campuses, and asks if they have any additional questions. We also have something that we had presented to you before called Decision Day Banners. And what Decision Day banners are is many high schools a few years back started having an event at the end of a, of a senior year where they, the students decide you know, what schools they're going to go to and they have banners from that school. And so normally we would attend those events and we would pass out the banners and celebrate with the students. Of course, there's no events to attend now, so all of this has to be virtual. So what we did was we reached out to the high schools to find out what students were going to attend Blinn, made sure they had filled out an Apply Texas application for Blinn, and then we mailed them their decision day banners because the high schools are still having virtual decision days. So that's how we communicated with them. Our recruiters also made a video, and the video congratulates all the seniors at our uh, service area high schools, and that video was sent to the counselors so that they could play that for the seniors. We had another project that we worked on this spring, and I called it the Outreach Project. So when we returned from our extended spring break, we knew that some of our students were probably having uh, stress related to uh, the move to completely online. We found out at that time that out of our 18,000 plus students that were attending, many of the students had already been called. So they had been called, say, by the housing office, that they were in housing, uh, by health sciences, by career and technical education. Uh, many others had been calling these students, but we found that we had about 9,000 students that had not been called. And so we commenced what we called an outreach project of about 50 faculty or staff that were calling students to ask them what they were having issues with. And you can see on this slide how they reported back to us. 20% had issues just with the stress of the pandemic. 11% uh, was the online course wasn't interactive enough. 31% said they weren't an online learner. And, and some had problems with internet connectivity. They also said that they appreciated us calling them. 39% of the students said that calling from Blinn was important. In fact, 74%, so that was the most important thing that had happened to them for the semester. 13% said that they liked the instructors being responsive. 3% were happy that we had online resources. And 7% said they were just happy that we continued their courses and that they were able to complete. We had about 220 students that let us know that they need assistance. And that could be comments like, I don't think my instructor's posting the grades fast enough, or I want my instructor to get back with me. And so we followed up on that. Either Dr. Brasicki or myself, depending on what kind of course it was, we took those 220 comments and followed up to let the students know that we were concerned and that we tried to resolve them. 
We communicate with the students all the time, but this particular semester it was really important. What you see on your screen now is just at the beginning of May, many of the student communication efforts that we sent out to keep the student involved in their semester, in their courses, letting them know about registration dates and upcoming events. <clears throat> we acquired a new software this semester. It's called the Booking Software. It's from Microsoft 365. We were introduced to it by Michael Welch. It's a product that comes with our 365 license that we have. And the booking software allows a student to find when their academic advisor is open, when they have sessions, and they go in and they book a, an appointment with the advisor and they can meet with them virtually. They can meet with them uh, by Teams or Skype where each person sees the other person, or they can just do it by phone but we found that the students really appreciate being able to schedule this time to talk with the advisors. We're getting about 30 of these requests uh, a day right now to set up a bookings uh, advising appointment. To piggyback on what Dr. Basiki said, we found that students didn't always understand what our online courses were about. And so they came up with the showcase project which has information that students can review if they're interested in an online course that can be for current students could be for prospective students for parents and we took it one step farther and you can see the YouTube video uh, link that's up there we worked with marketing and marketing helped us develop a video and in the video we have some instructors who talk about what it is to have an online course and we have student testimonials from students that were happy with their online courses telling other students um, that you know it's a great course and you know give it a try for your online students as he said sometimes students are just a little fearful of that so we think it goes hand in hand with the showcase course this video is on social media now um, and you can view it there the last item that we purchased this spring to help us with COVID-19 and our communication is called Ivy AI, AI standing for artificial intelligence, and it's a chat bot. And you'll see on the right side of the screen, uh, the <coughs> Lynn Buck, and it's a method that students, uh, prospective students, parents can ask a question. And this software crawls, it's referred to as crawling our website and finds the answer for the students. Um, many uh, colleges in Texas are using this particular software right now. Texas A&M is using it, UT, Tarrant County, Rice, uh, Shriner University. We think this is going to be very helpful. It is uh, almost ready for implementation. We're finishing up our training. Uh, once the software helps the students and the parents and prospective students find their answers, if it's not available, then it tells them who to contact. So there's a name of an individual and their contact information, email, phone number, and that person then can help them. It also then lets us know, students were searching for this piece of information, you didn't have it on your website, and we can go back in and make sure that that information is loaded onto the website. Um, my last item, I believe, is something that uh, Vice Chancellor Cervantes stole my thunder on, but I'll give you the more updated version. So I wanted to remind everyone that in spring of 2020, we had increases in all categories, headcount, credit hours, and contact hours, and that's compared to the 2019 census. So May Mini, our census day for May Mini is today. You'll see May Mini is up 16% for headcount, 16.6 in credit hours, and 15.9 in contact hours. Summer one has not started, so my comparisons for summer one, as Mr. Cervantes mentioned earlier in your workshop, these are just points in time for registration. So right now, this morning, headcount was up 1.6% compared to summer one of 2019, 2.9 in credit hours, and 4.7 in contact hours. And you know, that's with the fact that in summer one of 2019, we had 2,442 face-to-face students. We have no face-to-face -face students in summer one. So we've achieved this goal without having any face-to-face -face students. Indeed, we're still lower in summer two and in fall, but as Mr. Cervantes said earlier in your workshop, we're gaining on those each day. I think the next presentation is Mr. Cervantes.
Thank you. Eventually whittled down to one. Uh, we went through, they had one person that went through the entire semester and we continued to provide meals. When we go back in the summer, we plan to, we, we, we will have a scaled down workforce. That is normal for us. It's typically what we do because we don't have as many people on, on campus. But when we begin serving food in the fall, our plan is to serve food, but our task will be right now is to prepare for when we open up. Our plan consists of adherence to state guidelines, offering boxes to go, encouraging students to maintain social distancing with signage as well as table arrangements. Probably going to have in the front of, uh, in the student service in front of, of uh, before they go in, have to have those little cue cards that we're going to put down on, on the floor to keep them six feet apart as they wait in line to get in. Uh, we may have to go to different hours if that expanded hours if it turns out it gets to be t too tight in there uh, of course we're going to be in, uh, installing some acrylic as we are in different places throughout the campus anywhere where there is a, a student interaction uh, direct directly uh, especially as they come into the food service mail service we continue to provide mail service twice a week uh, we've done that since since we shut down and but we normally provide it to an empty office there's nobody there uh, they come in later on and they they pull up their mail mail when we um, when we open up we will eventually go we will be providing uh, mail service every day but we're not there yet purchasing and facilities they continue to process purchase requests and, and orders remotely uh, they processed a significant number of RFPs. You've heard some of them. I've heard some of them that we brought to the board, the bank depository, the custodial, and the master plan. I wanted to tell you a little bit how we managed that because we had to do things differently than what we normally do. On the master plan, we had vendors that made individual presentations to us uh, virtually uh, instead of meeting face-to-face. -face. Uh, it required a great deal of, of coordination and, of course, tests to make sure that we could pull it off but it worked out very well. Custodial, for the first time, we actually scheduled a mandatory meeting that we always do prior, prior to the bids, and instead of meeting face-to-face, -to -face, we conducted the meeting remotely. It was a little scary because we knew that we were gonna have over 16 people in that, uh, in that, in that space. Uh, ultimately, we ended up getting 12 proposals, and as you'll hear later on tonight, we think uh, we had a, a very satisfactory outcome. Purchasing right now, uh, continues to gather requests from departments for uh, personal protective mat materials and has begun to place orders in preparation for reopening. I mentioned the plexiglass, signage, masks, gloves, disinfecting uh, materials. Uh, as far as budgeting is concerned, all the expenses that we're incurring, I heard uh, doc Dr. Basicki mention some of the costs of software costs. I mentioned earlier in the workshop that we're going to turn those in to the federal government so that we can get reimbursed. If, if Michael Walsh ultimately, and we believe he will, uh, installs cameras into the uh, classrooms, we're going to be able to get reimbursed for, the, for those costs too. Accounting has set up an account uh, to collect all the transaction that, that Blend will use it as an audit trail to validate the requests that ultimately we make to the federal grant for, uh, grant for reimbursements. The employees can continue in, in accounting to come in sporadically during the week to process any invoices and to complete their efforts. Uh, one or two of us that have signature authority come in once a week after they've prepared the checks for us to be able to, to sign. We continue to do that. I did want to mention that in, in this environment, it is, we, we all know change management is, is difficult to begin with, but imagine change management in this environment and then it's like on steroids. It makes it much more difficult. Uh, but in the spirit of that, what we have discovered is that our team, and you've been hearing compliments about Blend left and right, and I'm going to continue them, they, they work very well together, these teams. And it's not just within our department, it's outside of the department, working with student services, working with human re resources. Uh, it's, it's all of them. And there is a cooperative spirit, spirit that, that has worked very well. And they have to, because some of these projects are not projects that you would do norm they're, they're 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 abnormal there's requests that are coming in to do things that has never been done before 
and now you have to work with these departments and test, this is the word that they say over and over again, they have to test it, test it, test it, and test it to make sure that it's gonna work. Let me give you some examples. The student refunds, $3.3 million. We had to make sure that uh, the, the accounts receivable, the amounts that they owed us, uh, that we were going to be able to collect that. That was a unique experience that we hadn't had, we hadn't had to experience before, and so we had to do things differently. First date of uh, refunding, we have an anomaly there. Uh, if a student go, wants to have a refund before that 12th class day, that's something we've never had to deal with before. And so we said we need to solve that. They solved it. And so I'm very proud of, of what they've done. Uh, CARES. The CARES grant to, to students that we just issued, first round of 2.6, I'm sorry if I'm maybe stealing some of your thunder. I've stole everybody else's. I might as well steal yours too. So uh, the first round of CARES funds, $2.6 million. They had to test that one extensively uh, to make sure. And it went out on Friday. It was deposited to Nelnet. It's made available to students. 3,300 students that it's been made available to them so that it's, those students now can, can, uh, uh, can, accept, can accept that money. And that, that uh, concludes my short responses. I will now turn this over to Chief Chancellor. May I have to give me a second to catch my breath and clear my glasses up, but uh, it takes a lot of air for us big guys to breathe. Uh, so for the police department, um, we have been providing uh, services to the campuses and patrol services to the campus 24-7, nonstop, since the uh, pandemic <coughs> began, and we will continue to do so. One of the things that we've done is our auxiliary people, non-officers, have uh, been answering phone lines that come into the college after the prospective vice chancellor gives permission for a uh, faculty member or staff member to come to the campus, then they contact the police department and let us know when they're coming to the campus, what building they're going in, and when they leave. And that's worked out really well to help us to keep track of who's in what buildings. And, and we haven't had any issues. And I know that it's kept uh, these two vice chancellors very busy with the phone calls that they get and people trying to uh, get on the campus. Uh, Another thing, uh, Mr. Bohart, I believe it was you that mentioned giving back to the community in the uh, uh, budget hearing. Uh, the police department has already been doing that. Uh, we have supplied uh, security services for the test COVID testing sites in both Brazos County and Washington County on numerous occasions. We will do that again tomorrow in uh, Washington County. Uh, and uh, for the next two weeks, we'll also be providing security at the Washington County Courthouse uh, for um, people entering the courthouse. They'll, we'll provide the security for that as well. Uh, one, couple last things. Um, I know that our officers are eager to get back to work, uh, to full staffing, and look forward to providing our students, faculty, and staff a safe environment as they return to Blinn College. And that's the end of my report. Thank you. And now coming to you live from Bryan, Texas, Vice Chancellor Marie Kirby. Uh -huh. <coughs> Maybe. Marie, you might be on mute. We're on mute. Thank you. We're on mute. Let's try this again. We're on mute. Um, can you hear us now? Yes, ma'am. Bill? It's possible we were muted by a presenter. Marie, we can hear you. Go ahead. Uh, maybe. them 
Joe says. Marie and Rich, this is Leighton. You we can, can hear, hear us. We can't hear you, Joe. Chancellor says he can hear us. Okay. You can hear us? Okay. Well, Marie's going to go ahead and proceed then. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Dr. Hensley, Chair Mosier, and Trustees. Thank you for the opportunity to provide a brief update. An analysis of the transition to working remotely for the past several weeks has proved successful. Our incredible Blinn family has risen to meet the challenges and has provided ongoing and excellent continuation of all services. Academic technology, payroll, accounting, benefits, online library services and tutoring, online advising, they're all some examples of how we have had continuation of excellent service. I've heard from many faculty and staff who shared that this has been a very positive opportunity for professional growth and development, not only in technology, but as well as finding new avenues for student engagement and the delivery of outstanding services to our internal and external partners. The college has charted a course that includes the protection and preservation of current employee positions through the implementation of a flexible hiring freeze through the next budget cycle. This also incorporates providing the high standards of successful outcomes that defines the Blinn College experience. As we move forward in the phased reopening of Blinn College, it is prudent to look to an historical perspective to guide us. The COVID-19 pandemic offers two critical challenges, the first obviously being the medical issues of the virus itself. Dr. Jeremy Green, medical historian of Johns Hopkins, identifies the second challenge as being of social nature and deemed as an epidemic of fear. That develops from the overwhelming effects of the pandemic. This epidemic of fear was evident in the bubonic plague, the smallpox, Spanish flu of 1918, and more recently Ebola and now COVID-19. Victor Vaughn, a prominent doctor in 1918 wrote, the virus demonstrated the inferiority of human inventions in the destruction of human life. And I think we can connect the dots to all of our medical personnel, all of our researchers today who are working tirelessly trying to find an interventions as well as a vaccine. So I guess we ask ourselves the question, as an institution, what do we do to offset this epidemic of fear that in our human resources uh, offices and our team that we're hearing from employees on a daily basis who truly um, do have that fear. Dr. Hensley, with skilled guidance, experience and foresight, along with her team, have worked to recognize and address employee uncertainties and fear by creating a culture of preparedness, safe practices and trust. The college is working with employees on an individual basis regarding requests for accommodations based on disabilities and health issues within the framework of ADA and FMLA laws. The college is also working with our 65 and older employees regarding return to work concerns while following CDC state and federal guidelines. In addition, the college continues to incorporate updated and ongoing compliance rules, such as the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. The overall plan embodies flexibility in scheduling, staggered shifts, and some continued remote work options based on student and business needs. The college will implement enhanced cleaning procedures, hand sanitizing stations throughout all campuses, social distancing practices, and continued Skype, Teams, etc. meetings. The overall safety and health of all is a top priority. Under Dr. Hensley's leadership, Blinn College continues to move forward with a culture of caring, a culture of compliance, a culture of compassion, a culture of capability, a culture of community spirit, a culture of competency, and a culture of champions. And finally, a culture of sustained economic continuity. Thank you for your time this evening. I'm going to turn it over to Rich Bray. <clears throat> thank you, Ms. Kirby, and thank you, Chair Mosher, members of the Board of Trustees, and Chancellor Hensley. 
On behalf of the Marketing Communications Department, I hope that you and your families are all enjoying good health and safety. As you know, much has changed in the past two months, but the core of Blinn's identity and its messaging remains the same. Regardless of the instructional format, Blinn students connect with caring professors who are dedicated to their success. They engage in challenging courses that prepare them for transfer to the state's leading four-year universities. They're prepared for rewarding careers, and all of this at an affordable tuition rate. Even as we adapt our marketing efforts to respond to COVID-19, this message of quality, affordable instruction remains at the center of our communications. As you can see on your monitor, we're utilizing a variety of digital advertisements to reach prospective students where they spend much of their time on their phones, tablets, and laptops. With digital advertisements, Blinn can better target its audience, focusing on individuals who have demonstrated an interest in topics such as college, financial aid and scholarships, and campus housing. Additionally, we can better track and modify our advertisements based upon the response to our messaging, wording, selling points, and even our imagery and color schemes used in the advertisement. While much of our digital advertising is with Google or with social media platforms such as Facebook and Instagram, we also have digital ad advertising campaigns in place with the Eagle, KWHI, the Battalion, and KAGS, allowing us to maintain strong relationships with our local advertising partners. Of course, with digital advertising, the ad itself is only half of the job. Once prospective students click on a digital ad, we must provide them with clear, easily digestible information on our website. To promote the May mini muster, we developed a landing page at blend.edu slash May. Individuals who clicked our digital ads specifically promoting May mini muster arrived at this page where they were told the benefits of enrolling in the May mini muster, could schedule a virtual visit with prospective student relations, were provided a table of available courses and their Texas A&M transfer equivalents, and received registration information. On the next slide, you can see a portion of the landing page we've created to support prospective student relations virtual visits. Many of our digital advertisements and the visit button in the top right corner of every Blend webpage were directed to this page at blend.edu slash virtual visit. Here, students can learn about each of Blend's campuses, its online offerings, degree and certificate programs, steps to apply, academic advising, and financial aid. We have supplemented our institutional digital advertising with targeted paid ads promoting specific academic programs with high growth potential. This spring, those programs include the Biotechnology Laboratory Sciences Program, the Online Associate Degree in Business, the Online Real Estate Certificate, and the Texas A&M Engineering Academy at Blinn Brenham. In addition to our digital advertising efforts, we continue to emphasize our traditional advertising channels. As you can see on the next slide, we have reserved ad space at the top of the front page of the banner press the first Sunday of every month. In April and May, this space was used to promote May, summer, and fall registration. Next month, we will promote summer one, summer two, and fall enrollment in this space. In April, we also purchased advertising space in the Belleville Times, Burleson County Tribune, The Eagle, Fayette County Record, Giddings Times and News, Lexington Leader, Navasota Examiner, Schulenberg Sticker, Sealy News, and The Waller Times. Wherever possible, we personalize each of our print ads to the community in which it appears. In this example on the screen, the advertisement on the left appeared in the Sealy News and features Sealy High School graduate Mackenzie Menke. In the advertisement on the right, which appeared in the Eagle, that features Bryan High School graduate Kaya Yanez. We also have ad campaigns in place with our radio and television partners, including KBTX, Sunlink, KX, KWHI, KNDE, KWBC, and KBUK. And I apologize, I won't be able to accept requests to repeat that five times fast. We also are working hard this summer to promote the new eSports program. As Dr. Hensley mentioned previously, uh, in that, uh, to that purpose, we plan to provide updates regarding the construction of the new eSports arenas in Brenham and Bryan, and to share announcements regarding the hiring of a new coach, the inaugural season schedule, and the initial recruiting class. 
We also plan a series of videos highlighting the first year of this exciting new program. This spring, we also place special emphasis on promoting Blinn's online courses. This initiative has included marketing of the new online tutoring tool available to students and advertising of Blinn's 24 degrees and certificates available completely online. We also developed the video that uh, Vice Chancellor Buck mentioned that is featured on Blinn's homepage, highlighting the personalized instruction and online tools available in Blinn's online programs. As you can see, while we have reduced our advertising in select venues, such as the Texas A&M campus and local movie theaters, Blinn's marketing department remains committed to sharing the news that Blinn continues to serve its community by provi providing affordable, high quality educational pathways. At this time, it's my pleasure to return the floor to Vice Chancellor Schubert. Thank you, uh, Chair Moser, fellow trustees, and, and Dr. Hensley. I want to just applaud all of the work that the staff has done on this. This has been, as you can tell, just in getting this small update, just a snippet of what has been going on behind the scenes over the last two months. I, I personally consider it a very high honor to be able to serve with this wonderful group of people on, on uh, this, this team and glad to be a part of everything that was, is, is happening here at Blinn College as we respond to COVID. I'm going to just cover a couple of things very briefly. Uh, Mr. Cervantes um, mentioned some of the CARES Act, and, and I'm glad he did. Uh, we can tag team on that a little bit, just so you get an overview of what, what CARES is doing for, for higher education, particularly in Blinn. Uh, the CARES Act had several different areas of money in it, and they're used for different purposes, and different regulations go with those separate areas. The main part of the CARES Act was um, Blinn received $14.1 million. Uh, half of that, which was a little over $7 million, went to direct student aid. Uh, that was a requirement from the Federal CARES Act that at least half of that go to direct student aid. As you heard, that's already in distribution. We broke that down into two distributions. The first is to our Pell eligible students. We did a block grant for those students. You heard that information earlier. It's on the way. The second half is going to be student applications. We developed an application process where the students uh, talk about um, the expenses they've had and different things that the Department of Education requires us to have in those applications. Uh, and then that will be gone through uh, by uh, different staff and employees. And then those distributions will happen once those applications start rolling in. The other half of that $14 million is the institutional expense portion. That's the portion that's going to be there around to attempt to make institutions whole. So the refunds that you've heard about for housing and parking and food services, that will come out of that. There'll be other items that will cover the institutional uh, expenses we've had for the instruction and technology and everything that you've heard uh, previously about tonight. Another pot of money is called Strengthening Institutions Programs, SIP funds. That's a little over $702,000 that's coming to Blinn. And as Mr. Cervantes mentioned, this one's a little different then because it can be used for lost revenue. Uh, the other ones are just to make you whole. This 700,000 pot can be used to fill some holes in those lost revenues that you have. So we're working through analyzing the requirements. And as I said, each of those pots of money has a different requirement from the federal government. And we're working through those regulations as we go uh, and, and um, um, work through that money and distribute it out as according to those guidelines. The other item I want to talk about, uh, you've heard mention of the announcement that's going out to our faculty and staff. Uh, you've heard lots of things about it tonight. I'm going to hit the highlights of what you haven't heard so we can drill down a little bit more. Uh, and of course, I'm glad to, to answer any questions you have at, at the conclusion. You've heard a lot about what we're doing to make our campus safer. You've heard about the social distancing requirements that we're impl implementing of the CDC guidelines. You've heard about our advanced cleaning protocols, uh, the use of face masks and face coverings. You've heard about the additional hand sanitizer stations we are procuring and we will be installing in every common area of every building on our campuses. I'm going to repeat that. Every building on our campuses will have additional hand sanitizer stations to be used by faculty, staff, and students uh, upon their entry. You've also heard about how the use of the facilities will be limited this summer. We will not be having our normal summer schedule of banquets and luncheons and camps and those sorts of things due to the social distancing guidelines. Uh, we're also looking at restricting those in the fall as well and we'll continue to roll out that information as it comes forward. One of the main items I want to talk with you about this evening is the phased return of employees to campus operations. This has been an item we've worked very diligently on over the past several weeks to develop a plan that balances the safety and health of our campus communities, but also the, the business needs of the college. Um, we do have to return to operations. They will look different. 
but we do have to return to operations uh, and, and get things going back now that we're getting into uh, out of the fall, uh, the spring semester into the summer. What we've designed here are three phases of employees returning to campus. That first phase will tentatively start on Monday, June 15th. The first phase will be limited to essential key personnel needed to resume operations. Uh, these are personnel that... On their uh, computer, we're muted. These are personnel that are need to be back on campus because they're for management purposes or their jobs are just not able to be performed. Uh, think about um, maintenance. Think about uh, the police officers who have been here. That, that's, that's what phase one is looking like. The goal that we're having in each one of these phases is lots of notice to our employees. We cannot inform an employee that next next Tuesday they have to be up for, for uh, on campus. They have to worry about things like child care, transportation, getting their lives back to normal. Uh, so we're giving uh, at least two weeks notice to our employees before they're, they're instructed that they're part of the phase. So for instance, if you're in phase one, Monday, June 15th, you will be receiving notice no later than Monday, June 1st that you were in that phase. Phase two will then begin uh, accordingly with the successful imp implementation of phase one. We will move forward with phase two. That will begin Monday, tentatively Monday, July 20th. These uh, employees will have notice no later than Monday, July 6th of their selection of re regarding into phase two. The maximum uh, um, uh, amount of employees in phase two will not exceed one half of our full-time employees. That's the goal for phase two. And then finally, phase three, uh, beginning Monday, August 17th, uh, those employees will be notified by Monday, August 3rd, and this will be an increased uh, uh, back to operations ramping up for the fall semester. Now, one of the questions you're going to have for me is how are, how are employees selected for these different phases? So we're going to walk through that a little bit. It's up to, uh, in conjunction with the direct supervisors and also for the human resource department and also their appropriate vice chancellors. And the first thing we're looking at is what are the essential business needs of the college? especially in phase one. What is essential that needs to open? Not all departments will be open for in-person, face-to-face working in phase one, but we're analyzing what departments are essential to that, and then those direct supervisors will be in conjunction with human resource department and the vice chancellors, will identify the positions, and they will then identify the employees that will fill those positions. That all has to be approved through the vice chancellors uh, appropriately. And then, once that selection is made, the direct supervisors will be in touch with those employees directly. Now, of course, we understand that some employees will have reasons, health reasons, uh, those sorts of things where they're not able to return. We obviously will be following all EEOC guidelines, CDC guidelines on uh, people who have compromised immune systems and all those sorts of things. There will be accommodations that can be requested uh, as outlined uh, with, with the HR department. Those accommodations will be discussed between the employee and the HR department directly. They work on all those sorts of things together. Uh, but in addition to accommodations that can be made, we're also allowing supervisors and want them to have the flexibility to determine their work uh, uh, schedule, if you will. Uh, we can still continue remote working. We've done a fabulous job with that over this semester. Uh, so the, uh, the, uh, the employees that can do that can still do remote working. We're, th we're looking at alternating days where one group of employees comes in on Monday or Wednesday, another group comes in on a Tuesday or Thursday, those sorts of things. And they also called st staggering reporting and duties, those sort of things. We're trying to get as much flexibility for our employees as we possibly can in a lot of these circumstances. Like I said, that will all be coordinated by the, uh, the direct supervisors, the HR department, and their appropriate vice chancellor. You've heard uh, several mentions about the fall semester and what's this going to look like. You've heard about academics and all those sort of things. I want to talk a little bit more about uh, the employee side of that as well. Uh, we will be developing a self-certification form. So before employees and students return in August for the full semester, uh, they will be self-certifying that they do not have COVID symptoms, have not been exposed to anyone with COVID symptoms, uh, and they will continue to self-certify on a weekly basis that that is true. Uh, if they do uh, have uh, answer yes, that they have had symptoms or they have had a contact with someone, they will, of course, then follow the self-quarantine um, um, guidelines from CDC and local public health authorities. And ultimately, we do have to plan for this. If, if a student or an employee does test positive for COVID-19, we do have protocols in place uh, in conjunction with our local health authorities to make sure that they are self-quarantining either at their home, if they're an employee, or if they're a student, we've dedicated uh, on-campus housing student, we've dedicated certain areas of the campus uh, housing facilities that will be uh, used for COVID positive students so that we can quarantine them uh, appropriately uh, as we move forward. 
So I want to thank everyone again for all of their work on this. Um, this is kind of the, the tip of the iceberg here, but we want to uh, appreciate your, your feedback and thoughts on this announcement as we go out. We'll, as the Chancellor said, we'll be re releasing this uh, here in the very near future, but we do welcome your feedback as well. Uh, and and to, to, to kind of bat clean up here on this uh, process, I'm going to invite Jason Jennings and Dr. Eric Alford from Baylor Scott & White to come and give their portion of the presentation. Thank you so much, Leighton. Chancellor Hensley, members of the board, I didn't think I'd be coming back with a pandemic, but I uh, <laughs> appreciate the invite back, and I appreciate Dr. Alford being with me. We'll tag team this to this presentation. I commend the work of the team. You, you're going to hear a lot of things that uh, parallel what we do in healthcare, as well as suggestions. We were just bringing suggestions. I've never led through a pandemic before. Uh, we're learning just like that. We use the word fluid quite a bit. Uh, we've changed our visitation policy no less than 16 times since this has came out, as well as PPE and other things. So please be patient with your team here at Blend because I guarantee they're staying on. But as the pandemic changed, the virus changes, we're learning new things. So just to jump in, I was asked to give some statistics. This was through yesterday, depending on the website you pull. I pulled Washington County as well as Brazos County. I won't read every number to you there, except for one. I would pay attention to Washington County having 181 confirmed cases. You'll hear Dr. Lesh in Washington County or Dr. Sullivan in Brazos County talk about this thing called clusters. And clusters just means uh, a, a place where two or more positive COVID uh, patients have resulted. So with that, if you take that 181 in Washington County, we've lost track really. I'm sure the Washington County uh, Health District has it, but Brenham Nursing Home and Rehab has had over 100 plus cases. So if you were just to do a subtraction from that standpoint, Washington County would have somewhere 70, 80 cases. Uh, Water for Nursing and Rehab in um, uh, Brazos County has uh, had 41 positive cases. That's led to a few of our positive cases in Brazos County. What keeps me at night is the nursing homes and the places that people congregate that are older in age as churches reopen or um, um, uh, jail systems of that nature and, and things. Uh, colleges don't worry me as much. High schools, if they were to return, etc. I commend you, uh, uh, Douglas's grandchild and my daughter tonight are their first soccer practice. They were on the same team. I confirmed that when I was in the back. And we had to attest that Taylor, my 14-year-old, didn't have signs of COVID. And they would not let her on the field today. So y'all are doing a lot of the great things that are out there. Um, there's a lot of things out there. Do the minorities, do minorities get uh, COVID more? There's no literature or science behind that. Your yellow's in Washington County. The blue is uh, Brazos County. You can see the breakdown percentage-wise from uh, COVID-positive patients. Gender, um, it's, it's, uh, what we've seen so far in our two counties, women a little bit more than men. And then age, if you were to take that far right, my right, uh, away, that's more of your nursing home impact. COVID really uh, hits about every age group, you can see, uh, so uh, from that standpoint. So we've coined a new word at Baylor Scott and White. We have to learn to coexist with COVID-19. Um, depending on the, epi I, uh, about every other week, and Layton's on those calls with me, epidemiologists from A&M will try to project when the peak is coming. Uh, my personal opinion, I don't think the peak is gonna come in. I think it's just gonna be flat for a period of time until a vaccine, in, and I think you're gonna continue to see be flattened with the, dis with the measures that you've already heard. Social distancing, washing your hand, and the right PPP PPE in place. So we've got to learn to coexist with COVID-19. Y'all have a, a, a job to re -edu to educate the next uh, lawyer, doctor, healthcare personnel, I hope a lot. So we've had to learn to coexist, and we'll just share a few things we've done at Baylor, Scott, and White. One is you've got to uh, tell your public that it is safe to come back. So we have uh, done a new marketing platform um, called Safe Care. You'll see some of that in the newspapers, televisions, billboards. It's all about convincing the public it is safe to come back for health care or for education. Part of that safe care, I won't read every word on here, is what are we doing for our patients, similar to your students? We are testing every elective case. Obviously, you can't test every admission that comes into a hospital. Uh, similar to how you're spacing out, uh, I've heard tonight, we're doing virtual waiting rooms, is what virtual care options. And with that, um, we are masking every patient, approved it, and we, in our hospitals, similar to what you suggested with here. Implants cleaning and touch-free protocols. Uh, we have um, have uh, secured UV light disinfection where we can go into a patient room and uh, kill any type of bacteria or virus, as well as uh, home monitoring that we're doing through a digital journey that we shared last time we talked with the board. 
and I'm going to let Dr. Alford take it from there. Thank you. So just like most entities across the world right now, we've learned to adapt with virtual care and digital platforms, and it's helped us tremendously. I think like most, uh, most other entities, um, we've had to adapt quicker than we thought we were going to, but we fortunately had a platform in place. So at Baylor Scott & White, we actually have a, um, access through MyBSW Health, and so if anybody who has a, a computer, a, a, a tablet, or a phone can access the hospital through this app, and essentially we give you access to a video visit with your own primary care provider, which we offer in Brenham and in Bryan College Station. I mean, you can also have access to e-visits. And it's important to know that this is not just for Baylor Scott and White um, patients who are already existing in the system. It can be for anybody. And basically, by logging into my BSW Health, you have access to get in and do an initial screening process to determine if you're best fit for an e-visit, um, a telephone visit, or a video visit. And the students would have access to this as well. Um, it, it's a really safe way to do it. Um, it gives a lot of information on COVID, and so we invite anyone to look over that if they have a chance. Um, kind of getting through the, the Brenham um, region specifically, um, on May 4th, Baylor Scott and White, kind of across the system, but specifically talking here in Brenham, um, began resuming normal clinic operations. Um, and by doing so, we really implemented the safe care policy and tried to make it clear that it is, in fact, safe to come back to the clinics. And one of the ways we're doing that is similar to what you guys are doing here at Blend to encourage students that it is safe to come back. And, and so we have multiple screening points um, throughout the process for getting visits. Um, when they make appointments, they're asked initial screening questions. We're having nurses that are asking questions. We're having front desk staff and all entry points are basically um, um, there for, for uh, screening before people actually enter the clinic. And then all, all people who enter the clinic are required to wear a mask and we ask that they bring their own mask at home. Um, and then any visitors um, has to have, or any visitor has to have a mask as well. And depending on if you're talking about the clinic or the hospital, we, we um, uh, limit visitors as a way to reduce transmission. We're going to talk a little bit about checking temperatures, and, and in all honesty, up until this week, we were checking temperatures on all patients. Um, the CDC's kind of gotten away from that, and so have we. Um, important to note, we have a respiratory clinic at the North Park Clinic, which most of you guys know as the original Brenham Clinic. Um, and so there is a designated area of our clinic specifically set aside for patients who have any respiratory symptoms. So if you have any of those, if you screen positive on one of these multiple points that I talked about, you'll be going through a respiratory clinic and not through the main clinic itself. Um, and then um, around May 4th, we also implemented um, elective surgeries um, and, and other continuing essential surgeries throughout all the hospital systems at Baylor Scott and White. Um, in order to have those procedures done, we are testing patients um, 48 hours before that appointment, um, and they get a COVID test. And if they're negative, they can proceed with the surgeries. And I tell you this because as we reopen um, the Blend campus, um, I think most of you know I serve as the medical director here at the, the clinic on campus. Um, and I work with Kristen Krennic, who is the PA that, that essentially runs the clinic. And we're going to implement very similar things in the clinic here. Um, one of the things that, that, that I can't emphasize enough, and you guys fortunately have already, already emphasized it for us, is simple hygiene and, 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 um, and infection precautions. Um, and it, it sounds crazy, but obviously um, we have to, to push the, that hand washing, um, social distancing, and wearing masks is, should really, in my opinion, be considered mandatory for all, all students um, and staff. And I think it's important that, that all faculty, staff, and RAs um, certainly set the precedent by doing so, and, and you guys are already doing that tonight. Um, I'm going to let Jason talk about housing now. Yeah, y'all have gone through this. Just These are just suggestions. Uh, single resident per room, if possible. Uh, require, uh, Dr. Alford said uh, personal face coverings. I get asked the question, as long as it covers the nose and the mouth, you're, you're fine. It can be a bandana if you want to give out blue and buccaneer bandanas or whatnot. Um, I've got a nice cloth one that I wear into the hospital each day in College Station, and then I move to the mask that you're wearing when I'm in, in health care. Um, enhanced cleaning that y'all have talked about already. And then if you've got common areas, just try to space out your, the students as much as possible. Um, training on public health measures, uh, y'all talked about signs. I think signs are extremely important. That's just a constant reminder that we still are in the pandemic. Uh, restrictions on events, social activities, uh, and if you bring those back, definitely have your social distancing. Um, and then definitely we have restricted access to our clinics and our hospitals. I would restrict access to non-students, to your dormitories and other uh, venues as well as this is really important and we probably could help with this with our clinic 
is if you have students or faculty or staff that are immunocompromised and there's a list up there, you're definitely going to want to have provisions to, to, uh, to identify those students, identify the faculty, so you can definitely take good care of those because they're a little bit more at risk for uh, COVID-19 illness and complications. So going along, late, I think you mentioned it a minute ago, is that, that as we identify, if we have to identify students or staff that have um, positive COVID tests, um, the, the predominant thing we're talking about here is especially residents. So if they're living on campus, we have to have an area um, designated, which it sounds like you do, for isolating and quarantining those patients following the CDC guidelines. Um, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this because it sounds like you've already done that, but basically identifying a room, um, labeling it as such, and, and really limiting the amount of people that can go in there, and that includes for food. Um, what we would like to see is that Blinn can provide student health services through a nursing or other um, um, employee health nurse or something similar that can monitor these patients or these students on a regular basis when they're in quarantine and then utilizing us as the clinic to help whenever necessary. So if it needed to come to us, we can certainly handle that. Um, one of the big things is contact tracing, and, and, and I'm sure you have something in place, but essentially one of the most important parts during this pandemic that the CDC has done and then our local health authorities have done is identified um, any cases and then going back and looking at the people who have been in direct contact with those patients. I mean, as you mentioned earlier, if you're a positive patient, you have to follow the guidelines as far as going back into the community, and that depends on if you're a healthcare worker, first line person, or um, if you're a general um, um, uh, individual citizen but but essentially we do recommend 14 days of quarantine for anybody who's been in close contact with a primary exposure and if you've had that um, positive test then you follow CDC guidelines which we're going to briefly talk about in a minute um, as we open up the clinic um, we want you guys to know that we will have access to testing at the clinic um, ironically, this just changed within the last couple of days, but, but I wrote on here that the COVID testing typically takes about six hours to get results. Um, that we, the inventory has gotten a little bit more scarce again. Testing is a lot more frequent, as you have seen, um, which has shown us a lot, a, a lot of increasing numbers. Um, so while we're waiting for inventory to come back, and it's already being worked on right now, it's typically about a 48-hour to 72-hour turnaround to get the test back, but it's through uh, Baylor Scott & White, which is a certified state lab. Um, importantly, if you have a student, um, um, and I'm, I'm going to predominantly talk about students here, um, is you have, if you have a student that has a positive test, we are recommending that they stay on campus if they're a resident and not go home so that we reduce that transmission, and I think that's what you guys have in place right now. Um, if you are a uh, person who has, is symptomatic but has a negative test, um, I'm sure you all have heard on the news that negative tests don't always mean that you truly don't have the disease, so we still treat them as though they do as a presumed positive, and we follow the CDC guidelines on, on that. From an employee perspective, because the clinic is going to be doing um, a lot of the, I think a lot of the screening initially, I would imagine for some of the employees, um, one of the things that I don't know if y'all have mentioned yet is how we determine when an employee can go back into service. Um, and there are some entities that are using the first bullet up there where it says that they remain in isolation um, until they are uh, fever free for 72 hours and at least 10 days have passed since the onset of symptoms or you can actually do two negative tests in a row that are 24 hours apart, um, but you still have to have that 72-hour uh, window without any symptoms at that time. Um, I mentioned earlier that Kristen Krennic is a physician assistant that, that ultimately sees all the patients at our clinic here, and she does a wonderful job. I think many of y'all have met her before. Um, I want y'all to know she's actually run our regional respiratory clinic here in Brenham for the past several weeks, and she's going to continue to do so until our clinic opens. Um, so she is not only experienced with the Blaine College students, but she's experienced with the respiratory care that they need um, during this pandemic time. So we feel very comfortable with her leading that charge. Um, we plan to implement similar protocol in the clinic here that we do in a lot of our rural outlying clinics such as Belleville and Hempstead. And the reason I say that is, is because we don't have enough personnel to necessarily have somebody sitting outside of the clinic at any given time to screen patients as they walk in. So what we're asking is that we limit the number of people in a building at any time inside of the clinic, I should say. Um, and we want that to be no more than five people at any given time. So Kristen will still have her nurse that works as the greeter at that time, and she will screen patients before they walk in. And then once they hit three students, meaning two, I mean, uh, two students, that would be one in each exam room and one in the waiting area, we would ask that the doors close at that time, and we'll put a sign up that says that there's no visitors allowed until we have available space. 
Um, as I said before, the COVID-19 testing will be available. Um, and then um, we want to make sure that all the students know that, that care is within um, a very easy uh, short distance away from them and that we're there to help them in whatever way possible. Just from a dining standpoint, same same message that you're hearing. We're in the right PPE. Custodial services should wear PPE, and then follow your CDC guidelines. Um, face masks, etc., should be when they're uh, moving among the dining facility. Um, access control. Uh, watch your cohort dining as well as physical space being six feet apart. You're hearing a common theme, and then I would as much as possible, which I heard tonight, don't have buffet-style food in your dining areas. Um, from a dorm standpoint, the number of dorms, uh, students in the dorms, we've talked about that. And um, it's really, I stole this from Governor Abbott. This is in his Reopening Texas uh, uh, book that he put out several weeks ago. Um, COVID's going to be with us. So how do we box it in and therefore keep the rest of us safe? And uh, what I've heard tonight, you've got a good plan in place uh, to do that. I, I want to reinforce from a testing standpoint, it is definitely a fluid situation. You have to be um, certified to do the test. We were lucky that our, our hospital and college station got certified. So that cut down the 48 to 72 hour uh, turnaround time to six hours, as Dr. Alfred said. As testing has become more prevalent and needed, therefore supplies uh, ebb and flow. So therefore now we're taking our test to Temple. We do expect that to get better. Uh, if you're considering testing the 1,000 students that will return to this campus potentially, I would encourage you to do a third party just because of the inventories. But if you have symptomatic students or faculty or staff, the right place would be to come to the clinic. Um, if they're scared to come to the clinic, get online with that digital app. They can do that. And then within a short period of time, a provider will call them back and give them the right direction if they need to be seen or not. And I just want to say from a personal standpoint, this is my 18-year-old, uh, Chancellor Hensley. Thank you. You helped her get into college. And uh, she is going to be going off, hopefully, this fall. And as a dad, not a CEO of a, of a region here with healthcare, I want to make sure that the things are in place. So I'll be asking the questions. She's done the Zoom orientation, all the things that you spoke of. And as a father, I've been reassured that uh, my 18-year-old, which is uh, one of the most three important things in my life, next to my wife and my other daughter, that I feel very comfortable with her going to college. Uh, we have to coexist with COVID-19, and she desires to go into healthcare. She's going to be a nurse or a physician's assistant. I couldn't imagine her having to do those classes completely online. Um, I think you said it well. I can remember, I hadn't thought about it. When I did one online class, I couldn't imagine trying to balance four to five online classes. So I'm very excited. Uh, Mary Harden Baylor is where she's going to be attending. She's, uh, they're, they're ex expecting to be open in the fall, and they're actually going to have some, uh, some in-person classes this summer. So I just tell you, as a dad, um, you're doing all the right things. I heard the right things. If she was coming to Blinn, I'd be very comfortable her coming here. So uh, with that, I think that's our last. And thanks for having us. And uh, we're open to questions. If you have questions along the way, uh, uh, Baylor, Scott, and White would, would love to be here and partner with you if we can to help. So and it's great to see you. So all the Thank great you, friends. Jason. Thank you. Yes, sir. We Mr. Have, uh, Mosier will be ready to stand for questions at any time. We have had a lot to digest here in the last hour and a half or so here. I don't, uh, what? Yeah. I'd like to make just a quick motion. I want to invite the board to join me in standing up and thanking, expressing our gratitude and, uh, excuse me, <clears throat> and thanks to the faculty and staff of Blinn College and uh, for the work they've done during the past few months. And, <laughs> job and they've been innovative and they've risen to the occasion and we can't tell you how much we appreciate it. Thank you, Thank you Teddy. I was, I was going to suggest a bonus, but I think that's better. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, yes, I, uh, just, uh, I do have a complaint uh, dealing with Baylor Scott and White. Uh, my, my my, my, my wife is having an uh, elective procedure tomorrow, and she said she had to take that COVID test. She says those nurses need to count faster. <laughs> One, two, three. It's too slow, she said. <laughs> Yeah. 
I just thought you should know that. <laughs> All right. Any questions regarding any of the reports that we've had? They're, I uh, very thorough. I mean, I, absolutely outstanding. It's, it's great. Uh, I'm, I remain a little unclear now. If I was taking freshman history, would I go all semester or just take it for four <laughs> weeks or for eight weeks or 16 weeks? Any of the above. Uh, any any of, the of the above. above. We, you know, we have a plethora of options for every one of our students. And so thank you. So trustees, based on our conversation this evening, our plan will be likely to distribute a memo to all employees tonight or no, by no later in the morning. It contains this amount of information and much more. And Chair Mosier and all the trustees, and I just want to tell you that you have before you the best administrative team. They are just wonderful. They represent so many others who have contributed to doing all of the plans that we have put together. And so I would like to commend them personally again once more for the great job that they have done. Thank you so very much. You have risen to the occasion. You've represented Blend beautifully. Thank you so very, very much. We do. Thank you. Thank you all so Mr. much. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. I, I just have uh, one idea. Uh, Dr. Kinsley, you mentioned this was going to go out to all the staff here. I think this is worthy of going out to the entire community at some point. Uh, uh, all our communities. Yes, sir. Thank you done. so very much. And Trustee Mosher and I were talking about that earlier today, so we do plan to put some special articles out in the local news, both in Brenham and Bryan and Celia and Schulenberg and other places, as well as radio announcements. The announcement that it's going out tonight is specifically answering questions for employees. And then we'll try to do some articles that will be impact, uh, we'll share the impact, for example, in the community, or what's going to blend look like in the community, and uh, what will happen to give them some, some feeling of, of safeness as we reopen Blinn College, that their local communities won't be negatively impacted. So any other con uh, contributions or suggestions you have, we will welcome them so much, but do expect more media, both in print and on audio and visual. Uh, someone was mentioning earlier about uh, ways that uh, Blend might be able to give back to the community. And, you know, I think with the need for testing and uh, anyway, that, that might be a way somehow. It's even just directing traffic or something, you know, to help with getting people tested because that has certainly been a Yet. Uh, lacking in our community. yes ma'am and our police officers have already been doing that as well and we'll continue to thank you any other suggestions please let us know thank you thank you all all right we're going to if, if no one has any other questions we're going to go ahead and move along we've got a ways to go yet this evening so and uh and staff you may go ahead and leave thank you they know which ones need to leave and which ones need to stay thank you all, thank you all. All right, uh, trustees, we get that takes us to the consent agenda. We've only have one item there, the minutes to be approved. I hear a motion. So move. We have a motion from Reverend so Wells. We, do I have a second? Second. We have a second from Mrs. Bain. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed say no. The motion carries. All right, that takes us to the discussion and possible action items. Uh, item A, authorization for the administration to negotiate and execute a contract. Custodial services at the Blinn Brown <coughs> campus, Blinn Bryant campus, and Blinn Rellis campus. Mr. Savantes, you're back on the uh, pre pre to present that, right? Thank you, thank you, Mr. an information sheet on 31 if anybody wants to look at that. Uh, Mr. O'Malley, do you have your, your phone on mute? Can you hear us? Yes, I can. You uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Cervantes. Uh, just, just, a, just a little loud. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Moser, Dr. Hensley, members of the board. Uh, the uh, the first, agenda, first agenda item tonight in our action area has to do with uh, custodial services on the Blinn Brenham, Bryan, and Rellis campus. Uh, the recommendation when this was drafted was to authorize the administration to negotiate and execute a contract with AHI facility services for custodial services 
on the Lynn Burnham campus, academic, administrative, and student service buildings, the Blinn Bryan campus, and the Blinn Rellis campus, and to negotiate and execute a contract with Southwest, pardon me, Southeast Service Corporation for the Blinn Burnham campus student housing buildings. As Mr. Cervantes mentioned earlier in the evening, um, we had a very robust response uh, to this solicitation for custodial services very well attended a virtual meeting discussing the project, and we received 12 uh, proposals from vendors that uh, were interested in the project. We put together a search committee that reviewed these proposals and scored each of those based on their experience, their qualifications, their methodology, the completeness of the proposal, and then their price. Unfortunately, right before tonight's meeting, we were informed by Southeast Service Corporation. Uh, they informed our, our director of purchasing that they were not interested in just performing services at the Blinn Burnham Campus Student Housing uh, Buildings. Therefore, I'm recommending uh, that we revise the motion such that we authorize the administration to negotiate and execute Richard, the contract. Can you, can you hear us, Richard? Yes. Can you wait just a second? It's, uh, your volume is not as high. Okay. I can talk louder. I'm going to wait a little bit. Let's see. Go ahead and keep talking just uh, so we can hear you. Did we hear the unfortunate part? Yes. We, I think we heard that, that piece of it. Okay. Uh, and I go might ahead and add. Speak up. Go I ahead and speak up if you would, too, Richard. I'd be happy to. I might add before I get to what I'm going to recommend as the motion is that uh, of those 12 vendors that uh, s submitted proposals, the majority of those uh, were all within our budgeted amount of $1.8 million uh, for the project. Uh, as, and as we were scoring these, we were trying to find the best value for the school and to take into account what options uh, would work best uh, with uh, different vendors uh, providing these services. Unfortunately, uh, one of those vendors that we recommended to you in this emotion, in this agenda item has since backed out. Uh, therefore, I'm recommending that we uh, have a motion that would authorize the administration to negotiate and execute a contract for custodial services on the Blinn Brenham, Blinn Bryan, and Blinn Brellis campuses that would provide the best value for the college and it stays within uh, the budgeted amount of $1.8 million. So, Richard, you're not recommending a specific uh, no. vendor? Uh, AHI facility services scored very high on all of our campuses. I would like uh, Mr. Kalkars to uh, go back and reassess uh, that scoring when we look at it uh, from all four campuses uh, combined together and, and select the firm uh, that meets that criteria and stay within the $1.8 million budget. Uh, Richard, this, this is Douglas. Just have a question. Uh, um, do any of these bids include the so-called, what I'm going to call, deep cleaning that, based upon everything we've heard today, is probably going to be have to be a part of uh, these custodial services, or is that something that's going to be negotiated separately? There, there could be some uh, negotiated separate services, yes, sir. Uh, the, we did revise uh, the proposal, uh, and it's certainly more in depth. And there's more uh, porters, there's more uh, personnel uh, that the college have at all of its locations, and it's uh, I think it's a, a better explained a deep cleaning a process that we're expecting just on their basic services. Uh, but COVID was unfolding, I guess, as this was going on, and we asked all the vendors to provide a COVID-19. Uh, response and how they would uh, treat that, and which uh, AHI did a very good job actually explaining that in their process in that. Uh, as we develop our cleaning plan for the next fall and how that might affect the frequency of cleaning in our classrooms, I could see that being a potential additional service. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. If, if, if I may add to, I, I have to love the federal government that 
all these costs, if there's additional costs as a result of this, this virus, we have an opportunity for a reimbursement and there's, there's an additional one that we would add to the list if, if it turns out we go there. Could, could you restate what, it, what, we're, what we're supposed to be doing tonight? Uh -oh. what, is, what do we need to do? Richard, can you go ahead. Authorize the administration to negotiate and execute a contract for the custodial services on the Blend Brenham, Bryant, and Rellis campuses. Okay. And that's for the 1.3? No, sir. No. That's what, we're, that's what we're doing. My recommendation is to extend that motion to include provide with a vendor providing the best value to the college and staying within the budgeted amount of $1.8 million. For the whole, everything? Yes, sir. Richard, this is Dan. I had a question. Did AHI Facility Services bid on the Blend Brenham Campus Student Housing? Yes, sir. Was their bid higher than this 216? Yes, sir, it was. Significantly? Uh, yes, sir, it was. Okay. All right, y'all have heard the <clears throat> recommendation of y'all. Do we want to do follow that advice? Entertain a motion if we all understand. Uh, What's the motion, Chairman? Uh, I like to um, move that the administration be allowed to negotiate and execute a contract with. Uh, um, up to a million eight hundred thousand dollars for custodial services for the Blinn Brenham campus, uh, Brian Blinn Brian campus, Blinn Rellis campus, uh, at the million eight number to the most qualified uh, firm that they can find. And you're putting in the uh, last the Brenham student housing. Uh, yes. 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 Good. Okay. Second. We have a motion from Mr. Bohart and a second from Mr. Colcourse. Any discussion on the motion? Are we all clear on where we are? We spend a million eight. <laughs> yeah. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say no. The motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Thank you all. Are you going to handle Is he going to handle it? <coughs> no. Thank you. <laughs> okay, that brings us to item B, the authorization for the administration to seek proposals, furniture, fixture, and equipment for the science, technology, and engineering and innovation building. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Dr. Hansley, members of the board. This, this particular project, I'm going to hand this over to Mark Feldhake, should, who should, appears to always be, also be on the line. Mark, can you go ahead? Yes, sir. Can, can you all hear me fine? Can hear you fine. Very good. Thank you very much, Chairman Mosier, Dr. Hensley, members of the board. Uh, I'm presenting in, uh, to you this evening item 6B. Uh, this is requesting authorization for the administration to seek proposals for furniture, fixtures, and equipment for the science, technology, engineering, and innovation building on the Blinn Brenham campus. Uh, this authorization will allow administration to seek proposals for furniture, fixtures, and equipment and uh, to provide the required amenities for our new uh, STEI building. Uh, the overall project budget is 35.5 million and that includes a soft cost budget of 7.8 million. Uh, within the soft cost budget we have allocated 5.2 million for these FF and E items. Uh, also included in the soft cost budget are 2.4 million for professional services uh, and 200,000 for the central plan upgrades. These FF and E items would include furniture, AV items, IT equipment, security equipment, signage graphics, and other building amenities. Uh, upon the board's approval, the administration would solicit uh, FF&E uh, vendors for proposals, and if any of those proposals exceed $100,000, uh, the administration would then present uh, the proposal to the board for approval. Uh, funds for this project are available in the 2019 series bond funds uh, for this project. Uh, and with that, I'll stand for any questions. Is the 2.4 million for professional services, is that on the total project? Yes, sir. That, that is what we are, are paying uh, for, for the architect's fees and some construction manager fees and, and some similar uh, materials testing fees.
I thought we approved some central plant upgrades up previously on something, didn't, didn't we not? Is that a different something? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That 200,000 of this project was allocated towards the central up, uh, plant upgrades project, as well as about 600,000 in R and R funds for a central plant upgrades project. That project is underway. So just to be clear, this motion needs to address the FF and E portion, correct? That is correct, sir. I move that uh, the administration be allowed to solicit FFE vendors for proposals for the uh, Science, uh, Technology, Engineering, and Innovation Building. I'll second. We have a motion from Mr. Kokors and a second from Mr. Gatewood. Any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say no. The motion carries. Thank you. That brings us to number C, the, the authorization for the administration to negotiate and execute a contract for the development of a district-wide facilities master plan. Mr. Cervantes. Thank, thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman, Dr. Hensley, members of the board. This We're going to go back to Mr. O'Malley, who will, will uh, make this presentation. Thanks again, Mr. Cervantes. Uh, Mr. Moser, Dr. Hensley, members of the board. Uh, item 6E has to do with uh, authorization to negotiate and execute a contract for a district-wide facilities master plan. Uh, in October of 2019, the board authorized administration to seek proposals for the development of the district-wide facilities master plan. And you may recall that in that solicitation, uh, we laid out several objectives for a master plan, but the three main objectives are to develop a comprehensive, flexible, long-range plan for the effective use and reuse of existing owned and leased property, facilities and infrastructure, and possible expansion and acquisition of campus facilities to meet future needs. To prepare the college district to meet the community need for expanded workforce and technical education training, and to position the college district for future growth and expansion. The development of a district-wide master plan will at a minimum include meetings with the board, district leadership, campus advisory committee, student groups, school districts, and community groups, a demographic analysis, enrollment projections, facility condition assessment, utilization analysis, and then an implement implementation plan. This uh, process is going to take uh, 10 to 12 months to complete, and uh, with your, uh, well, let me back up. Uh, the college received seven uh, proposals uh, with this solicitation. Uh, we put together a search committee uh, that reviewed uh, the proposals and interviewed three of the firms uh, uh, to, for further consideration. Uh, the, the, again, this, uh, these, were, these interviews were conducted with a virtual platform on April the 16th of 2020. Uh, the master plan is going to take about 10 to 12 months to complete, and with your approval tonight, we're, uh, we're recommending that we move forward with M. Arthur Gensler, Jr. and Associates from Houston, Texas, uh, for this exciting uh, district plan, district facilities master plan project. Richard, this is Douglas. I, I just have a question. Uh, if I understood you correctly, you went out for a previous bid and three firms bid on it and then we went back out a second time and there were seven that is correct yes sir was this group in the first three no sir okay is gensler are they done work with are we done work with them before or what like yes, sir. They're the consultant we're using for our Relish 2 project uh, right now. They've done business all over the world if you go to their website. Uh, yeah, they're, I think there's a place in the world they haven't been. <laughs> That's correct. And I think that our budget uh, is 800000 for that project. Yeah, yes, sir, Mr. Kalkars. That's, that's what we have budgeted for that project, and uh, that's what we intend to... Uh, uh, negotiate our, you know, the service to, the services to include uh, within that budget. Okay. Uh, 
Richard, who will participate in that? I mean, do we, how does that work from the college's standpoint? I mean, it, uh, what's the, how do they work that? How does it work? Well, we'll have a steering committee that will be managed through the facilities office uh, for the master plan, and then uh, we'll have a steering committee that will be made up of uh, uh, basically every segment of the college, every department or division will have some role uh, in providing input uh, with what the needs and goals and vision is for the college moving forward. Uh, certainly, the board is a big part of that, and our, uh, our, our district leadership you know, will be the uh, the two biggest players in uh, putting together what that vision is going forward. So there will be board representation on that steering committee? I don't know if the steering committee has actually been formed yet, but I know that be, there will be opportunities for the board to have to sit in meetings, be a part of meetings, and to be uh, uh, asked questions about how the, what the direction of the college is moving forward. situations in uh, uh, master plans they look for him to gather information as Richard said from all segments it could be internal you, you folks would be the external there'll be folks in the community the school district and, and so it, it takes a, a broad spectrum you would not per se I would not imagine be part of a committee but your input would be sought uh, as you would for any of those other other groups in fact more so so what did you just say? You're not part of a committee per se. You are you are a group that we would go to and ask for input into the process. You would be if you were part of a committee as an example, we would see that as more operational and less less governance. My question though, my only comment talking about to develop what, what path of development in the, in the service area that is our responsibility, Glenn's responsibility, that the elected officials ought to have some kind of a routine or some kind of a participation that allows that information for them to provide some input or information that, that I'm not sure that it would they could get from the staff itself. Uh, Mr. Moser, I, I agree with you. In fact, I, I see the board being one of the first two meetings that were held uh, with our consultant to help set that vision. Mr. Wells, I don't know that I heard all of your question. Uh, in reference to Gensler, yes, they've certainly performed uh, these type of projects before, if that's what you were asking. And as far as uh, the previous master plans uh, that have been done for the college, uh, when we developed the Bryan campus, uh, it was, I can't remember the consultant, SWA, I think, or SAW, uh, was the consultant that the college hired 20 years ago. Uh, for that process, the board played an integral part in developing that plan. All right, trustees, anybody else have a question, comment? Well, I would uh, entertain a motion that we authorize the uh, administration to uh, negotiate and execute the contract with Arthur Ginsburg, Jr. and Associates. So I have a motion from Mr. Cocorse. Do I have a second? Second. second from Mr. Gaywood. Any discussion on the motion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say no. Motion carries unanimous. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. Thank you very much.
brings us to all right we have an executive session uh, that will meet in accordance with 551.071 072 073 and 074 uh, we will not be taking any action after that uh, you, you want to take a break I, please uh, please please yeah I had to take mine earlier. Yeah, I saw that. <laughs> All right, we will take a, let's see, it's 745. How about, let's take 10, 10 minutes. How about that? 755 looks for it.